this point, though, will you, will you pray with me? God, thank you for delivering us from every trouble. Jesus, even in the midst of the most severe of suffering and persecution, whether it's intentionally for being a Christian or whether the suffering is just the, the difficulties that come with living in, a, living in a fallen world, God, thank you for delivering us. God, we can, we can say we have been delivered even if we don't see the deliverance today because we know, Jesus, that you will return. God, thank you for drawing us to your Son. And God, this morning, would you make your Son most precious? Would you make your Son the treasure and the delight of all that are in this room? Oh God, we seek your glory. Make your Son known through the preaching of your word. Amen. Christ calls us to follow him. There's two simple beginning calls to that of, of Jesus. There's two simple calls that Jesus makes for the beginning of, of his ministry. The first call is simple. Repent and believe. That, that's the first call. Repent and believe. Why? Because the kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's an open call to everyone. Repent and believe. But Jesus goes and makes specific calls to individuals. If you will, repent and believe is kind of a blanket statement. Everyone needs to repent and believe. But the follow me call that Jesus makes is an intimate call. You, personally. Insert your name here. Follow me. And Christ calls us to follow him. And so today as we enter into Matthew 16, verses 24 through 28, we're going to be answering the question... What does it look like to follow Jesus? What, what does it look like to follow Jesus? You might even ask it in this way. What does it look like to be his disciple? What does it look like to be a disciple of Jesus? Or thirdly, you might even ask it like this. What does it look like to be an authentic Christian? There's a lot of fakers out there. As a, as a child, we had a word called poser. You're just a poser. You know, you're someone who's, that was faking it. They actually weren't that. They dressed like it, they looked like it, they talked like it, but they didn't actually do whatever it was they were posing. And so people can call themselves a Christian. People can call themselves a disciple. There's, there's no law, if you will, and you're not going to go to jail if you call yourself a Christian and you're not a Christian. But what does it look like? You expect that if someone calls themselves something that it, that it follows, that their life looks a particular way. You know, if, if you say that you're a sports fan, you know, there's certain things that you expect to follow. If you say that you're a farmer, you would think that there's certain things that would follow. But if you call yourself a Christian, what does it look like? And so we're looking at what does it look like to follow Christ? Synonyms for Christian might be disciple, might be following Jesus, might be obeying Jesus, might be believer, might be saint. You can use any of these words. So when I'm speaking about following Jesus or I'm speaking about being a disciple of Jesus or when I'm talking about being a Christian, I'm, I'm using these almost interchangeably today. You know, they all have their different nuance. But what does it mean to be a follower of Jesus? What does it mean to follow after him? And once again, this shows the divine providence of God. I didn't plan this sermon after last sermon. I didn't plan for them to... I, I didn't intentionally plan for these particular verses to follow the sermon last week of saved by grace rather this was god ordering through his divine order these things but as i was studying this week i i was smiling i was smiling about what god had worked together because i want you to think about this we are saved by grace through faith right we listen to that list. saved by grace through faith but if you are saved by grace through faith that will produce obedience. If you are saved by grace through faith, that will produce following Jesus. You cannot be saved, so it's impossible to be saved and yet not follow Jesus. Well, I'm a Christian. What does it look like? 
Well, I, don't get me bothered with you know, those religious things. What matters is in my heart. False. What matters is the totality of your life. Everything in your life points to your claim of you are a Christian. We can't put this nice, clean divide. I'm a Christian and the rest of my life. So some of you have a day job, you know, paid nine to five. And some of you have a, a, a job which, which, which goes beyond that, but let's talk about the day job. Those of you that have a day job, a nine to five job, or maybe it's you know five in the morning to four in the afternoon, who cares, but you get the point. You may do that job from nine to five, but that does not define who you are, right? You, you, don't, you, you may do that task for those hours, but once you clock out, you're done. You walk away from it. You, you segment, you compartmentalize, you walk away from it. You're no longer doing that. Right? If, if you are a hamburger maker, if you flip hamburgers, you don't have to do that 24-7. You flip the last hamburger, you turn off the grill, you go home. You know, so insert your career there, your job there. You can turn it off, you go home. But when it comes to Christ, you can't do that. Well, I'm a Christ here, I segment it, and then I turn it off to go do the rest of my life. You know, I work, you know, I'm a Christian Monday through Friday, but then I, you know, I do what I really want to do on the weekends. Or I'm a Christian Sunday, but then I do what I want to do the rest of the time. In Christ, there is no compartmentalizing. If you are saved by grace, if you are a child of God, your entire life reflects that reality. The gospel begins with repent and believe, but it continues with follow and obey. There is no such thing as repentance without obedience. Or said another way, confession, confessing your sins, confessing that Jesus is God, confession without obedience proves our confession was a lie. Those who are saved by Christ follow Christ. It's that simple. If you were saved by Christ, you follow Christ. So I have four questions that I want to work through from our text, but let's read our text. Jesus says, in verse 24, Then Jesus told his disciples, If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. So what... What does it look like to follow Jesus? Because first thing that Jesus says, if anyone would follow after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. So even before we get to the question of what do I have to do to follow Jesus, if we're just saying, okay, what does following Jesus look like? Okay, if, if you're to say, there's a follower of Jesus, or if you want to follow Jesus, this is what it's going to look like. Let's just, let's just can you just describe, paint a picture for me of what, what a follower of Jesus looks like, or someone who follows Jesus. What, is, what does that look like? Even before we get to whether I want to follow Jesus, because do I even want to pursue that? You know, hey, hey I want you to do something. Well, tell me more about it. You know, let, let, me, let me know. Hey, there's this job opportunity. Describe it for me before I pursue. I'm not going to turn in an application or a resume and then say, oh, by the way, what, what am I doing in this job? Oh, by the way, what am I doing in this role? Instead, you say, okay, tell me more. Like, let, before I invest before I commit, before I submit to this lifestyle, what is it? And so the first thing that we can see that a life of following Jesus looks like, what following Jesus looks like is obedience. And as someone who follows Jesus obeys God. John 14, 15. If you love me, you will obey my commands. That's simple. The first thing is, if, if you love Jesus, you will obey his command. So if you're a follower of Jesus, you're going to obey him. It, it, is, it is rightly and appropriate to say, it is hypocritical to say, I follow Jesus and yet not obey him. Right? You know, if, if you take marriage vows and you 
break the marriage vows, you question the veracity, you, you question the truthfulness of the marriage vows. Did you really mean that when you said that? And so if you are going to follow Jesus, or if you're going to look at someone who follows Jesus, you're going to see that they are obedient to Jesus. But you're also going to see that if someone is, is a follower of Jesus, you're going to see that they're godly. Now in, now in our age, there's actually this thing that goes around, you know, you don't have to be, have a clean life to come to Jesus, and you know, don't clean up your life to come to Jesus, Jesus will clean your life up. But there's almost this divide at times where you can come to Jesus and still remain ungodly, and that's cool. You know, Jesus accepts you the way you are. There, there's a truth to that. Yes, Jesus accepts you the way you are, but Jesus does not leave you the way that you are, right? A, a loving parent will gladly receive their child with a dirty diaper. They won't say, no, you have a dirty diaper, get away from me. They will gladly receive them, but what are they going to do? They are going to change that diaper. Why? Because it stinks. Need to clean you up. Need to change you. It would actually be unloving for the parent to not change the diaper. But what, does a di- what does a child do every time you try to change a diaper? Screams, wiggles, does not sit still, fights you the entire time. Yeah, that's an analogy of us. God's trying to change us. And we're like, no, 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 I- I'm fine being ungodly. Leave me alone. I want to follow you without having to be changed by you. And we need to understand that this is what it means to follow Jesus. We are going to obey, but we're also going to be godly. Uh, you can look to the qualifications of elder and overseer as an example. So I'm just going to read out of Titus uh, chapter 1. But it says uh, in Titus chapter 1, verse 5, This is why I left you in Crete, Titus, so that you might put what remained into order and appoint elders in every town as I directed you. So what should an elder be? And this is important because an elder ought to be exemplary of what it is to be a godly Christian. An elder, a pastor, ought to exemplify what it looks like. If, if, if I as an elder do not exemplify what it looks like to follow Jesus, I'm in sin and you're in sin. I'm in sin because I'm not pursuing Jesus rightly and you're in sin because you're allowing an ungodly elder to continue in that role. But listen to this. If anyone is above reproach, the husband of one wife, and his children are believers and not open to the charge of debauchery or insubordination. For an overseer as God's steward must be above reproach. He must not be arrogant or quick-tempered or a drunkard or violent or greedy for gain, but hospitable, a lover of good, self-controlled, upright, holy, disciplined. He must hold firm to the trustworthy word as taught so that he may be able to give instruction in sound doctrine and also to rebuke those who contradict it. If you are a follower of Jesus, you are going to live a godly life. Does that mean you're perfect? No. Am I perfect? No. Is there any elder pastor who's perfect? No, but that's not the point. The point is not perfection. The point is that there is a pursuit of godliness. Yesterday you were less godly than you are today, and tomorrow you'll be more godly than you are today. Why? Because you are pursuing Christ obediently. If you're also going to look at what it looks like to follow Jesus, you're going to find that someone who follows Jesus is word-saturated. What does Revelation say? That the, that the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. Or you read Psalm 119, or you read Psalm 1, where there is this great emphasis upon the word of God. When someone pricks a follower of Jesus, they say, ow, but when you prick a follower of Jesus... They bleed the Bible. They bleed the Word of God. Every problem they go through, they search the Scriptures to see if the Scriptures have an answer or resolve to it. When they are rejoicing, they look to Scriptures to see how to more excellently honor God in the rejoicing. But a follower of Jesus is obedient, is godly, but is word-saturated. And also a, a follower of Jesus is a disciple maker. Matthew 28. Go therefore, make disciples. Disciple all nations. Make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them all that I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Someone who follows Jesus helps others do the same. I'm following Jesus, and you need to come with me. Sometimes we take them in a chokehold, don't take them in a chokehold. But... We want people to come. Like you, you, you have this desire to help other people come along. 
sometimes we're rough at that. Um, we, we are hurtful, you know, and followers of Jews sometimes are hurtful, but their, their desire is, if you will, good in intent. They desire people to come along, and sometimes we, we drag someone when they just need a hand. But the reality is someone who is following Jesus desires to help others follow Jesus as well. It's not, I'm following Jesus and other people can go their own way. I don't care, you know. What works for me works for me. What works for you works for you. No, a follower of Jesus desires that others would do the same as well. And lastly, what else does a follower of Jesus look like? Looks like, well, a love for the church. A love for the church. An intimate love, not a distant love. A, a personal love, not a generic love. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah I love the church. I, yeah, I love the church. No, no, no. I love you and you and you and you and you. Like a, a, an intimate, personal, I love these people. I love God's people. When you meet a Christian, it's not weird. Oh, oh, you're a Christian. Oh, gosh, I got need to change how I live. No, but when you meet a Christian, your, your eyes kind of perk up. A believer. A believer, someone that loves Jesus. All right, my people. We, you know, we may not disagree on everything. You know, when you meet a believer, you're like, well, are you really a believer? No, no, you like meet a believer and you're like, you know what? You're a believer. I'm a believer. We love Jesus. When we find out our differences as time goes on, you know, we'll deal with those, but a believer. If you would, read uh, 1 John chapter 3 with me. 1 John, not Gospel John, but 1 John. And listen to how John explains the love for one another and identifying the love that an individual has for believers and for the church of God as a sign and a mark of being a follower of Christ. First John chapter 3, verses 4 through 11. Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices um, lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. So once again, that kind of deals with the obedience, godliness aspect. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. Jesus appeared to take away sins. No one who abides in him, in Jesus, keeps on sinning. Once again, godliness, obedience. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. You cannot make a practice, not that you cannot sin, but you cannot make a practice, a habit of sinning, a willful desire to sin and say you're still a Christian. Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous, as Jesus is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning, because he has been born of God by this. And he's making this emphasis. You cannot be a follower of Christ, a lover of God, and continue in sin. And he says, and by this, by this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. All right? So, how, okay, how do we determine if someone loves God, someone is righteous, or someone loves the devil and is unrighteous? Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God. Catch that. If you do not practice righteousness, if you do not pursue godliness and obedience, you're not of God. And then he puts some rubber to that. As if the rims on the tire weren't strong enough. He puts some rubber and really just puts some traction on it. Nor is the one who does not love his brother. Not fleshly brother, but spiritual brother, spiritual sister. A follower of Christ will necessarily love the brother and sister in Christ. Read in verse 11, For this is the message that you have heard from the beginning, that we should love one another. You can't be obedient to Christ, you can't be godly unless you love the church, unless you love the people of God. It's impossible. What a delight that God has said His people will love His people. What does a follower of God look like? Someone who's obedient, who's godly, who's word-saturated, who's a disciple-maker, who loves the church. Okay. 
We get it. That's what a follower looks like. I don't think anyone's going to argue against, argue against that. They might argue that someone is actually living that way. But the next question, what will it cost me to follow Jesus? What will it cost you to follow Jesus? There's a cost. And some of you might go, well, I thought grace was free. Yes, grace is free, but it will cost you. This makes sense. If I gave you a car, or anyone gave you a car, free, you don't have to buy the car. What do you have to do? You still have to put tags on it. You still have to put gas in it. You still have to put maintenance into it. So this free car is still going to cost you something. Now, does that mean we go back to the person who gave us a free car and say, you lied to me. You said this car was free. No, you're going to say no. Implicit in the gift is the cost of owning the gift. Implicit in the gift of salvation is the cost of salvation. We cannot earn our salvation, but now that we are saved, what will it cost us? We cannot earn following Jesus, but now that we follow him, what will it cost us? We, we need to understand. Listen what it says right here. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. You must deny yourself. You must put yourself away. Take up his cross and follow me. Complete surrender. What will it cost me to follow Jesus? Complete surrender. Absolute humility to the point of death. If you signed up for the military, you would sign a paper that says, I am willing to die. Sign here. The moment that you sign here on that military paperwork, you have died. It's not if you die, it's a question of when you die. The moment that you sign that, you're, you're dead. You just count yourself as dead. Just come to terms with you are going to die in this line of service. Now, if at the end of that, you don't die, great. But the moment that you sign that, you are signing, I am willing to stand in front of a loaded gun. The receiving end. Christ is saying the same thing. When we come to him and say, I want to follow you, he's saying you must deny yourself. If you want to follow him, you must deny yourself. You must pick up your cross and then you can follow. You must pick up your noose, we could say. You must pick up your electric chair. You must pick up your lethal injection and follow Jesus to your grave. Jesus is not saying a light thing here. When someone says, what does it mean to become a Christian? We need to express to them that they are completely surrendering their life. When you are considering what it means to follow Jesus, you must understand you are completely surrendering your life to Christ. There is no hidden area of your life. Jesus can have everything except this. Everything is his. You are denying yourself of everything. Because Jesus says, for it is only in your death in Christ that you will find your life. When Jesus came, he says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Repent of what? Your sin. You are sinning. And because of sin, you are going to die. The wages of sin is death. We need to understand that Jesus is saying, for you to follow me, you don't get to say, I want to be saved and live my life the way that I've currently been living it. This is the reason why most people don't do too well at a new trade or a new hobby or skill. You know, how many of you have learned something on a piano? You know, most of you have learned something on Even if it's like there are white keys and black keys, most of you have learned something about a piano and how it works. But some of you are accomplished pianists and some of you are accomplished listeners of pianists. There's, there's, a, there's a mark, there's a moment in every skill or trade or hobby, there's a mark where you say the cost 
is not worth it to pursue. The, the, the gain is not worth the cost. Whatever is beyond this cost, not worth it. Some of you are like, yeah, I can, you know, do the things, and you hear the chopsticks. And some people play that, and they love it, and they're like, I'm amazing. Play something else. That's all I got. That they, they got the, this one thing, or, or they can do a C scale, you know, and that, that's all they got. That, that's it. But, but it's like, well, to learn more, you're actually going to have to give up of time and energy. You're going to have to humble yourself. And when a piano teacher says, don't do this, do this, you're going to have to say, yes, sir, yes, ma'am. It's going to cost you money. You're going to have to buy books, and you're going to have to pay for piano tuning or buy a new instrument. You know, all these things that it's going to cost you. You're going to have to give up free time with friends and, and other activities so that you can practice and get better. People don't just sit down at an instrument or a hobby or a task and all, oh, they're a prodigy. And even prodigies still have to practice and still have to learn and get better. When you follow Jesus, you don't just say, I'm a follower of Jesus, and then that's it. Jesus says, you have to commit yourself to death, not murder. This is not the, the religion of Islam or an honor religion where you get to go around and kill people and then earn bonus points in heaven. Not suicide where you can go and just kind of kill yourself and say, well, I'm just going to, oh, I just go to kill myself. That's what it is. It means like suicide. Yeah, that's what God's... No, he's not talking about that. What he's saying is you, it's a self-sacrifice. God, whatever you require, it's yours. Whatever you demand of me, it's yours. Whatever you require of me, it's yours. There's no argument. There's no debate. There's no delay. This is what it means to follow Christ. Complete surrender. Absolute humility. Death. Picking up your noose. Picking up your electric chair. Picking up your lethal injection, picking up the instrument of your death and following Jesus to your grave. For it is only when you lose your life in Christ, not when you lose your life doing good. Listen what he says. In verse 25, but whoever loses his life for my sake. So if you do good all your life and you die doing good, that's not what Jesus is talking about. Well, they're a good person doing good things, and so they're going to have a good life. No, whoever loses their life for the sake of Christ, then you will find it. Do you want to follow Jesus? It's going to cost you everything. And it's not just a, well, I did that one time. And parents, we do really bad at this, we have a desire to kind of form up and firm up our children's salvation when they're not. But we, we need to understand that if we want to follow Christ, it's not I took up my cross that one day, every single day. Every day you wake up, today, Lord, this day belongs to you. And tomorrow, and the day after that, and the day after that. Jesus does not have visitation rights to your life. Jesus does not have shared custody of your life. Jesus has ultimate and final control over your life or you're not following him. Now my desire is that all of you would follow Jesus, but you need to understand, you have to make that decision and come to terms with it between you and Jesus. Jesus and say, do I follow, do I believe, or do I not? I can't force you, I can't strong arm you into obedience. That's the work of the Holy Spirit, not me, but I can plead and beg and exhort you that the cost is worth it. Giving up of everything is worth it, at which point we should ask the question, well, what is the benefit? What is the reward of following Jesus? Or what is at stake? And there's two categories that I'm going to deal with. There's many things that we could search Scripture for, but I'm just going to look at two categories. And the first thing, the what is the benefit? What is the reward of following Jesus? You know what a follower looks like? 
and you know what it's going to cost you, but you still need to know, okay, but what, what do I get out of the deal? If I walked up to you and said, give me $1,000, you're probably going to ask, why? And rightly so. No one would say, how dare you question me? Give me $1,000. You're going to say, hey, you're a great guy, but tell me why you're wanting this money. You would treat anyone the same way. If someone came up to you and said, do this for me, you're most likely going to ask, why? And why is not a bad question. The spirit can be bad, the spirit can be wrong, but why is a honest question? Why? What will it cost me to follow Jesus? Well, everything. Okay, but what's the benefit? What do I get out of this? What do I get out of this? When the first thing, you get God's greatest treasure. You get Christ. The greatest thing that you get out of following Jesus is Christ. That is the greatest thing. If there was nothing else after that, it would be infinitely worth it to follow Christ. If, if you got nothing else, and the only thing that you got for following Christ was Christ, it would be worth it right there. John, shut your mouth. Let's go home. That's enough. If we understand the worth and the value of who Christ was, God's greatest treasure, if we understood that worth and that value, that's enough. That's, I, I, I'm sold. Well, how do we know that Christ is God's greatest treasure? It says in John chapter 5, verse 20, For the Father loves the Son and shows Him all that He Himself is doing. The Father shows the Son. God the Father shows God the Son all that God the Father is doing. Everything that the Father does, the Son knows about. That's a unique position. No one else has that position, has that role. Or if you just look to the next page in Matthew chapter 17, Matthew chapter 17, verse 5, it says, He was still speaking when, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. The Father is well pleased with the Son, and those who follow Christ get the Son. Or you consider Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. Those who who follow Christ gain the delight and the joy of the Father, the servant, the one who died on your behalf. The one who died on your behalf was God's greatest treasure. God destroyed that which he loved for your benefit. That should bring us to a high position and to think well of ourselves, but always under the worth and the value of Christ. Because it is only when God had risen Christ from the dead that we gain Christ. John chapter 1, verse 12, But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What is the benefit? What is the reward of following Jesus? First and foremost, Christ. You get Christ, the one who intercedes on your behalf, the one who cares for you, that is concerned for you, the one that intimately knows your joys and your sorrows. He He is our greatest treasure because he is the Father's greatest treasure. And those who follow Christ get Christ. But not only do we get Christ, not only do we get an infinite benefit, an infinite reward, we get more. And not in kind of that weird, cheap TV salesman, but wait, there's more. But serious moreness. There is more. Consider this, if you would. We not only get Christ, but we also get reward for deeds and eternal life. Listen what it says. 
Verse 26, for what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? And what are you going to get? If you die, you die. But what do you get if you pursue Christ? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. He says right there, look, some of you are going to see Jesus coming in his kingdom. We're going to deal with that in, in Matthew 17, the transfiguration. <coughs> Excuse me. But he says, he says right here, he says that we are going to be repaid for our deeds. What does that mean? Well, we, we, we not only get the benefit of Christ, but we're rewarded for that which we do in our obedience to Christ. Well, what does that mean? Turn with me to Revelation, Revelation chapter 20. It is important to understand that, that when we follow Christ, we get Christ. That is beautiful and amazing. And, and it's appropriate to say, but that's not all we gain. We gain even more than that. Revelation chapter 20, verses 11, verses 12, and verse 15. John speaking, he says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who was seated on it, from his presence, earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. Verse 15, And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. There are books in heaven. And they keep a record and an account of what you have done. And the first question is, have you received Christ? Have you believed the testimony of Jesus Christ? That's the first question. Have you believed that? If you believe that, praise God, you are saved. But then now, now that you are saved, what is else? what else is written? And there is also written the deeds which you do. And I have hammered this many times before and hammered again. Your present life, your present work has real worth and value. God records everything that you do for him and you will be rewarded accordingly. We see that in Matthew 16 and we see that here. You will be rewarded and judged for all that you have done. So yes, we should be obedient for the sake of righteousness and for the sake of the glory of God. But on top of that, there's just a reward for being obedient. There's an, there's an added benefit. There's an added joy. There's a delight. What is the benefit? What is the reward of following Jesus? What is at stake? Well, first, Christ, but second, rewards for deeds in eternal life. It's not like we just get to hang out with Jesus for an hour or two. All of us have people that we look up to. Maybe a political figure, maybe a sports figure, uh, or maybe just another person in, in a different particular field of hobby or interest. And if you were able to eat lunch with them, just eat lunch with them, just you, the two of you, uninterrupted, and the person was, you knew the person was going to be absolutely engaged. They weren't like bored with you. You know they're going to be engaged. And, and you would live the rest of your life kind of on a cloud nine situation. Oh my gosh, I ate with so-and-so. It was amazing. You know, they're, they're my favorite musician. They're my favorite sports person. They're my favorite whatever. You would have this excitement about it. You would be content. You wouldn't be like, oh, I only got an hour. My life is horrible. You say, I got an hour. He didn't, he didn't have to give me an hour. She didn't have to give me an hour, but gave me an hour. You'd be happy and content about it. If we just had an hour with Jesus and then we ceased to exist, it would have been worth it. Would have been worth it. Well, just, just an hour, and I'm speaking hypothetically. If we just had an hour, just a short time with Jesus, no interruption, just you and Jesus, me and Jesus, just uninterrupted, we would be content with it. We'd want more, but we'd say, oh, man, it was worth it. It was worth it living a life of obedience to have one hour with him. 
But we are not just promised one hour with Christ. We are promised all of eternity with Christ. What a joy and a privilege it is. What is the cost of following Jesus? Your life. What do you gain? Eternity. What does disobedience cost you? We see in Revelation that you were thrown into the lake of fire. I mean, it just it just doesn't make sense. The, the most insufficient accountant, the most insufficient investor could say, well, it'd just be worth it because like hell doesn't even sound like a good place. But Christ says, come and follow me and we follow him and we gain everything. There is nothing to lose that is of significance and value. Like, but my life is so important. You don't understand how important Christ is. You don't understand how important Christ is. At five, how much money would you have given to know what you know now? I'm speaking to those who are older than five, but at five, how much money would you have given? Would you have given up your pudding snack at five to gain what you know now? Would you have given up your favorite toy to gain what you know now? Would you have given up a day of life? Would you have given up a favorite experience to gain what you know now at five? How much more ought we to give up our very life to gain Christ for all of eternity? But we value our life so much and we value Christ so little that when we look at Christ and we look at our life, we go, nothing could be greater than my life. We even look at marriage this way. There's nothing greater than marriage. And marriage is it. It's best. There's, I can't foresee anything in heaven outweighing the value and the beauty of marriage. We value things in this life so much and Christ so little that when Christ says, you gain me, you gain eternity, we go, is that it? Is that all I get, God? Is there anything else I get in heaven? Is there anything else I get in eternity? Because, you know, I mean, you're cool. Don't get me wrong, I like you. I got some cool songs about you, but is there anything else? The cost is infinitely worth it because the treasure is is infinitely and eternally valuable. What does it following Jesus look like? What will it cost me to follow Jesus? What is the benefit and the reward of following Jesus? What is at stake? Okay. So how can I be discipled so that I might follow Jesus? you understand what a follower ought to look like. You understand at least the basic starting ground. Okay, what does it look like to follow Jesus? You, you now understand, at least in, in basic form, what will it cost you to follow Jesus? And you understand what, is, what you gain, what the reward is. So, so there's the question, okay, well, I want to follow Jesus. So, so what should this look like? What should this look like? What should it look like to follow Jesus? Like, I get it, godliness and obedience, but okay, what... What are some very just tangible, practical ways that I can begin following Jesus? And really, it's learning. It's learning. You want to become a better sports player? Obviously, I don't play sports. (laughs) Player of the sports. You need to learn. You want to be a better musician? Well, athlete, that's the word. If you want to be a better musician, you have to learn. If you want to be a better business person, you know, manager or or, or investor, you have to learn. Anything that you want to become better at, you have to learn. So if you want to follow Jesus, you have to learn. So I I want to put some 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 things in your hands, if you will, of okay, John, I, I I I want to learn. What do I have to do? What are some ways? And mind you, just because you do these things doesn't mean you're a follower of Jesus, but doing these things helps you along the process of following Jesus. I could find lots of posers or fakers to do these things. But here's some things that you can do. All right, but first let's read, if you would, Ephesians chapter 4. Galatians, Ephesians. All right, so it says, chapter 4, verses 11 through 20. 
It says, and he, God, gave the apostles and the prophets, the evangelists, the shepherds, the pastors, and teachers. Okay, we know elders and overseers and shepherds are synonymous terms. Why did God give apostles? Why did he give them prophets? Why did he give evangelists and shepherds and teachers? Why did God give the church these roles? Well, we read, as we read forward, to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to mature manhood, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, so that we may no longer be children tossed to and fro by the waves, carried about by every wind of doctrine, by human cunning, by craftiness and deceitful schemes, Rather, speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in every way into him who is the head, into Christ, from whom the whole body, the church, joined and held together by every joint with which it is equipped. When each part, when each part of the body of the church is working properly, makes the body grow so that it builds itself up in love. All right, so I want to start with the, the most fundamental way that you can follow Jesus is to entrust yourself to the ministry of elders and overseers, to entrust yourself to the ministry of pastors. Okay, this is real important. It is the role of pastors to disciple the flock. It is my job as an elder, as a, as a pastor, to disciple you. That, that's, that's my primary responsibility. Why? So that you can go do what you're supposed to do. It is my job to teach you how to do ministry, and then you go do the ministry. John, how how do I do this? How do I do that? I get questions like that, and those are great questions. And my job is to help you see in Scripture how you can obey Christ in that scenario. And it's my delight. I love teaching people. And people ask me like a simple question. They want 30-second answer, and I'm like five minutes later. They're all, all right, I had the answer in the first five seconds, but he keeps going. Okay. But this, this, is, this is great. This is beautiful. We who are elders and called to that ministry of elder have the responsibility to equip the church, to disciple the church for ministry through the ministry of the word. It is my job through the ministry of the word to equip you for the work of ministry so that you can do what you're supposed to do. And that also builds up the church. So listen to this. Formal opportunities. You want to follow Christ? Here are some simple ways that you can begin following Christ. One, sit under the faithful, expository preaching of the Word of God. If, if, if nothing else, if you sit under the faithful preaching of the Word of God, week in, week out, you are going to do better and fare better in your walk with Christ than if you don't. I have been told by those who study the Puritans... Right? I've been told by those who study the Puritans that if you had to pick between an hour of reading the Bible a week or an hour of the preaching of the Word of God a week, pick an hour of preaching the Word of God a week. Because the Puritans understood the weight and the value of the preaching of the Word. Let me put it this way. If you could read the words of Jesus or you could hear the words of Jesus, if you could read what Jesus said or you could hear what Jesus said, we would all say, I want to hear, I want to hear. There is, a, there is a reality to the hearing, to the verbal, physical, air-moving, vocal cords rattling proclamation of the Word of God that God works through that in a unique way that He does not work in other ways. You want to follow Christ? You want to grow in Christ? Sit under the faithful preaching of the Word of God. That is my responsibility, first and foremost, is to preach the Word of God. You want to grow in Christ? You want to follow Christ? Commit to that. You want to you wanna also grow in Christ? Find where else the Word of God is taught. Sunday school. Find groups where the Word of God is taught. Sunday school is a, a tangible example. We have Sunday school here. We have adults and we have kids and we're trying to you know, do all the things to make sure we have for the, the, the different groups. But even home Bible studies and, and, and Bible studies throughout the week with people. But if you just spend time studying the Word with other people and discussing how it plays out, it will do amazing things in helping you follow Christ. Because 
From this context, you hear me preaching and talking and, and making clear. But in those small groups, you go, oh, well, you're having troubles and you're having troubles. Oh, all right, I, I get it. Okay, I, you explain that. That makes sense. That there's a sense of, of, of community and growing together. And okay, if, if they can endure their troubles different as they may be, then I can endure my troubles different as they may be. It's not about all of us going to the same problem small group but all of us observing the different struggles that people are having. It's not, well, let's get all the people who have no left foot in the same room to deal with the suffering of no left foot in the room. Honestly, someone who's dealing with no left foot in the room is going to benefit from someone who has no right hand in the room. Oh, you know what? We both are with, that, with a loss. Your loss is different than mine. My loss is different than mine. But I appreciate my hand more. I appreciate my foot more. Just being in a room with people who are suffering differently than you, studying the Word of God is going to help you walk with Christ and follow Christ so much better. Men's and women's Bible studies as well. Men learning how to be men from men and women learning how to be women from women. That's great. Obeying the Word of God that men should raise up men and women should raise up women. Or there's the pastoral discipleship meetings that we've been starting this year, inaugurating this year, where I have an opportunity to sit down one-on-one with the church members and with the households and say, okay, where are you at spiritually? And I get to find out where you're at spiritually. And then, all right, we're going to go in and I'll see you again in a year. But working year after year after year and in time being able to help you and your family grow in godliness and, and dealing with those things in your family and, and For me, I I have seen fruit just in those few that we've had already. And I look forward to the years in the future of saying, okay, I get to pour into you. I get the privilege, not the burden. I get the privilege of of the responsibility of equipping you for ministry. And I get to do that from the pulpit. I get to do that from, from the classroom. I get to do that from the family table. These are great ways of, of learning how to follow Jesus. There's also informal ways. You want, you want to, okay, well, these are great, okay, but what's some more ways I can follow Jesus better? Here, here's a few more. Personally commit to daily reading the Bible. I thought you just said that thing about Puritans and reading and preaching. Great. Get under the preaching of the Word of God and then read the Bible every day. Well, how much do I have to read? How much time do you have? Uh, personally for me, four chapters a day is my, is my goal. That, that's my regiment. Four chapters a day. Some of you are like, four? I do 20. Great, do 20. Some of you are like, 20? I, I can get like 20 verses in and then my mind wanders. Discipline yourself. Start with 20 and then go from there. You know, mothers of toddlers have a more difficult time. So it's okay, well, you, you get a stolen moment here or there. And, but there's a discipline. But you want to grow in your walk with Christ? Read the Bible. Commit to it. You want to grow in your walk with Christ? Look around your life. Look around the church and ask a godly person to disciple you. Say, hey, can we spend scheduled times together reading the Word and scheduled times studying the Word and, and you just teach me everything. You appear to be a godly, obedient follower of Jesus Christ and, and I, I don't think you're perfect, but I need your help. I want, I want to observe you and, and I want to follow you as you follow Christ. Can, can you teach me? Or read books. A great book to start with is The Cost of Discipleship by Dietrich Bonhoeffer. You read that book and it's going to teach you a lot about following Christ. And from the first chapter, he's throwing punches. You walk away from that first chapter a little bit beat up and saying, you know, I'm, I'm in, I'm in. Okay, but how? Okay, maybe you've done some of these things. Some of these things are regular in life. And how do you like? I need. I, I want G, John. I want more. I want more of Jesus. I want to follow Jesus. I want to. I feel like I've picked up a cross, but you know, I just feel a little bit slack. And Lord, how else can I follow Jesus? Well, teach. You want to grow in Christ? Start teaching. Sunday school class, Bible study, uh, a Bible study at work or a Bible study in your community, start teaching. You want to grow in Christ, you want to follow Christ, and you want to see your walk with Christ deepen, start teaching. Or ask a younger believer to disciple them. 
Schedule meetings with them. Share meals with them. Invite them over to your house and say, hey, I don't think I'm better than you. I don't think I'm more important than you. But I'm older in the faith. I've learned a few things, and I'd love to spend time with you. What if we meet once a week or once a month for this next while? I just want to pour into you, teach you what I know. You ask me questions. We'll, we'll go read through this book of the Bible. But pour into someone. I don't have anyone. There's always children and grandchildren that need to hear the Word of God. And sometimes, discipling a child or a grandchild might be you just write them a letter once a week. Or with a small child, maybe you just spend time with them a little bit, you know, five minutes here, five minutes there. You know, kids, you're all flitty and whatnot. It's okay. Brother and sister, we have been saved by grace through faith in Christ. But being saved by grace through faith in Christ produces obedience. It produces discipleship. It produces following Jesus. The gospel begins with repent and believe, but it continues with follow and obey. There is no such thing as repentance without obedience. Confession without obedience proves our confession is a lie. But those who are saved by Christ, those who are saved by Christ follow Christ. I urge you and I plead with you, follow Christ. The cost is worth it. And pray with me. God, what a joy it is to serve You. What a privilege it is to know You, to declare that You are righteous and worthy of all praise. God, would we be a people who are known for our obedience, our godliness, not to assert ourselves over others, but in the greatest humility, loving one another and loving others. Holy Spirit, would you demonstrate that following Christ is worth the cost of even our life? Jesus, thank you for being our example and being our substitute. To you be the glory. Amen.